Hi. Well, I'm hoping that I inspire some of you folks to get involved. There's so many things you can do in OFC that um, can take up a lot of time or just a little bit of time. And they're fun and there's lots of good opportunities. So mostly that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, let's see if we can make this thing work. There it is. Let's put it on play. Bingo. Okay. Um, how many of you went to scale this year? Okay. If you stopped by our booth there, you saw this banner, which has a listing of some of the different organizations that are uh, involved with OLPC and keeping the movement going. Um, and we'll talk about the official OLPC too tonight. But these are some of the things that you might want to get involved with in one way or another. And we'll mention some. And uh, notice up there in the left hand corner, some of you are already involved in Internet in the Box. How many of you have worked on Radix's Internet in the Box project? Okay, very good. So we have that going on. We have all kinds of other things, and we'll take a look at some of those. Uh, here's some of the things you can do in OLPC as a volunteer. Lots and lots of different kinds of things and fun. And, uh, it's really, I haven't done all of these things, but I have done almost all of them. So we'll, it's funny, the colors are coming out strange on these. Now, first of all, what's happening with the official OLPC? Well, they're still making machines. And they're not making them in huge quantities because they make them on order now. And if you were to place an order for them, you might have to wait three months or so because they're built in the Quanta factory in China, which makes other machines as well. And so when you want to get some OLPCs made, you put your order in, Quanta gears up for it, makes them, and there they are. So if you want to do a fairly small order, you can piggyback on some of the bigger orders. And there are bigger orders going in from time to time, and you just put your thing in, and when a big order comes along, and they're going to tool up and make it go, then they put yours in too. And these are all XO4s now, touch screen. I don't know that they're making any 175s anymore. The price difference was very small, and most people wanted the touch screen. And as I said two years ago at scale, I really think that that is the best machine for kids that has ever been made, and nobody's beat it yet, uh, especially with iPods that, or iPads that they pass out in LA Unified. So Rwanda has added 2,800 new XO4s just now, and they have several thousand, actually I think about 100,000 more on order. So they're building out their XO deployment. Now, there are two sides to OLPC. There's the association and the foundation. The association is the business side, and it has been based in Miami. And they're the ones that came out with the XO tablet. How many of you have heard of or seen the XO tablet? Okay. What do you think of it? You like it? I don't. Uh, they have it kind of locked. They've got these little apps that they picked, they had experts pick. Well, I know one of the experts, she has a master's in business. She's an MBA, she's not an educator. She's one of the people, or a counselor. And she picked these little things so you can find out what kids want to do with their life. So if your four-year-old likes to play uh, a finger painting thing, then it's going to tell you that your four-year-old wants to be an artist, and you're supposed to direct the child in that direction. That's a bunch of baloney. I'm a retired school counselor, so I can tell you that with a little authority. But they lock them. You can take them out, actually hide them, but you can't put anything better in place. So if you wanted to put an app in that you can get on any Android tablet that's good, that works, you want to take out the things that they put on that don't work. You can't. You can't exchange them. You can hide. I'm sure you can delete them, but you can hide the ones that don't work. Like you go on, there's supposed to be a free app, but when you get there, you find out you have to pay to get the content. Sure, the app's free, but the content is. 
So you want storybooks, you go to storybooks, and it takes you right to where you have to buy it. So forget that. So that's what the association is continuing to do, and they have kind of turned the ordering part of it over to a different group called the Zamora Tehran Foundation of Nicaragua. And they've been in existence in Nicaragua for uh, five years next month. And they have distributed over 30,000 XOs to the schools in Nicaragua. And they will be, it's a big banking family. They have a lot of money and they kind of know how to run a business and so forth. And so they're going to be taking over the control of the manufacture of the machines. And the machines will be uh, mostly made for South America, South America, and for uh, Africa. Now, if you want to volunteer with the Zamora Tehran Foundation in Nicaragua, it's not one you want to have on my list, but I will mention that if you go to their website, they do have a place that they talk about volunteers. Most of their volunteers are coming from places like you now. University of Nacional de Mexico. Uh, most of their volunteers are from Central America. So we really haven't had a lot of involvement with them. In general, the OLPC volunteer group really had no clue who these people were when they came into the picture. But I've researched them pretty well, and they look like they're really a uh, good group, and they're going to do a good job, I'm sure, because with what they've done in Nicaragua, it's been excellent. So they're in good hands. And uh, you can want to go to Nicaragua or someplace like that, you can take a look and see what they've got. Now, the OPC Foundation is the software side and also the hardware design side. And they, well, let's put it this way, Nicholas Negroponte has other interests now. He's doing all these other things. He doesn't really want to be bothered with OLPC anymore as his big thing. So they didn't quite know what they were going to do. They closed the Boston office. You probably saw some things in the online flap sheets that, you know, all the OLPC was disappearing and all because they closed their Boston office. No, it's just really true. They just formed an alliance with OLPC France. And OLPC France, who does lots of wonderful things, which we'll mention a few more tonight, uh, is kind of taking over with the software development and um, I don't know whether they're going to do much new on hardware, but they do move along and there is some progress in that area, but the hardware is pretty good as it is now. They find bugs, things that need fixing, and they take care of that. But basically the hardware is solid, it's good, it works, you know, what more could you want? Maybe a little bit faster processor, but that could come. Okay, now. I put out an email if you're on my support gang, not my list, but the support gang list or the IAEP, it's an education project list. You got an email from me saying, hey, who needs volunteers? And I got back a lot of comments from people about where volunteers were needed and what they could do, and that's what we have for you tonight. Uh, I do have one that <laughs> she didn't get back with me yet, except to say, I'm going to send you information, and it hasn't come yet, so that one's not here yet. But here's two that were mentioned that need some help. Cambodia is a school that, interestingly enough, is run by, uh, or that foundation that does the project there, is run by Nicholas Negroponte's ex-wife. And she has a really good project going in a school, and you can volunteer there, and they love to have people come. Now, if you're going to volunteer, you pretty much have to spend, um, you know, by the time you take the travel time back and forth, you better plan to spend two or three weeks. Otherwise, it isn't going to be worth your time or theirs, because it takes you a while to get acclimated to what's going on and everything. And you might be doing any number of things, as you'll see. Now, this uh, school in Cambodia and uh, what I'm going to do, these links here, you can write them down if you want, but uh, I'm going to put on the uh, website that we have, which I haven't put anything on since I created it long ago, but the OLPC Aussie website, which you'll have a, a link for tonight. I will put um, a copy of this set of slides with live links so that you can just click on them and go if you want. 
So Ghana is another place where they've done a lot of things, and they are moving along and getting more. OLPC France, oh, we're going the wrong way. Sorry, we just did that. <laughs> it's coming up later, too. OLPC France has what is one of the neatest little projects. It's in a place called Nosy Comba, just off the coastline of Madagascar. And I know some folks that have gone there and helped out in school. The, uh, the project is just really, really neat, and it's a great place to go. Tropical island, and of course, you can you know, test. You know, Madagascar has, it's not as many as Madagascar, but a lot of interesting wildlife and beautiful snorkeling. And if you want to go volunteer someplace, it's really nice. And don't mind sleeping on the floor, maybe. Or, you know, it's a good place to go. Haiti. Okay. Um, you had Kurt's talk yes, last month, and so you know about the Haiti project. Um, you know what Kurt did there. Uh, did he mention anything like, like uh, installing solar panels mm -hmm. and internet in a box and all that good stuff? Okay. Haiti is wide open for volunteers. If you want to go down there, airfares are fairly reasonable. To go to Haiti, it doesn't cost, it probably costs less than going to Hawaii most of the time. So you can go there, the people are friendly and nice, they speak Creole and French. So if you speak French, you can get along just fine. Uh, some speak English, but mostly it would be the French that you would be doing. Um, any of you meet Tony Anderson at scale? That's Tony in the corner with a little kid. He was helping on the XO and working on a project together. And that Adam Holt is in the um, one on the left. Do you know who Adam is? Get one or two people. He's just shaking the head. Yes, okay. All right, Kenya. Lots of things going on in Kenya. And again, it's mostly working with whatever they want you to do. In other words, when you do this kind of volunteering, you don't go and say, oh, I'm here to do such and such for you. You go and you say, what do you want me to do? How can I help you? And that's when they will tell you that, oh, gee, we need you to help our teachers learn how to do X, Y, Z, or we need you to help us install some solar panels, or we're having trouble getting our uh, Wi-Fi system working, maybe you can help us with that. You know, they will have all kinds of needs that they will come to you with. So they may be asking for all kinds of different uh, sorts of skills. Uh, South America, most of the South American volunteers come from uh, Central and South America, but some people from the United States have gone down there as volunteers. As volunteers. Peru is one place, and they do have a project in Puno, uh, which is Oh, that's by the way to the top, isn't it? Yeah. So it's up in high elevation and it's in the Andes Mountains and it would be a nice place to go and spend some time. Bolivia, uh, there are tiny little deployments in Bolivia. Bolivia has problems with getting, well, they've always got a new government. <laughs> Every time the government changes, you know, one government will say, oh, we love the XOs, we want to put OLBC in our school. And then the next governor comes in, and anything that the guy before wanted to do, they don't want to do. They want to do their thing. So, so far, the government hasn't bought into it on a big scale. But there are some small projects. Um, there's a person that I work with on some other things who has a small project going um, in Santa Cruz, which is in the tropical part of um, Bolivia. It's kind of lower elevation. Um, it's a bit tropical. It's probably just about the largest city in Bolivia, other than maybe La Paz. So it's a big city, very nice, there's a university there, and they do have a project there. So that's one place where you could go, and I can put you in touch with the person that does that project if you're interested in going. And when you do a project like that, we usually uh, send people with a few XOs. Because this is one of those projects where um, they didn't go out and buy a whole bunch. They're picking them up here and there, people with their XOs from what, oh, the old um, get one, give one, and you know, they don't need the machine anymore, they're tired of playing with it, the kids have grown up, and so forth. And, but it still works, 
they'll take it. So we have a lot of projects that do that sort of thing. Uh, here's an example of one. This one, how many of you know where Lesotho is? <laughs> Lesotho is a tiny little principality. Actually, it's about the size of Maryland. Completely surrounded by South Africa. And the, there's a woman in Idaho who's a former Peace Corps worker, and she worked in Lesotho in her youth. And so she's very interested in doing something there. So she has two projects going. She's collected, oh, about 120 different XOs, and she has sent them down with people over time. She has her little foundation, and she's been doing this so long, she's going to be, next month, she's going to turn the running of it over to somebody else. But she's been doing this project there, and these two schools are out where there's absolutely no infrastructure. No electricity, <laughs> nothing. No Wi-Fi or anything. So this is a place where you would get things like the internet in a box. It would be really, really good. They have solar panels there. Uh, they don't have them on the roof like they did in Haiti. They actually have small solar panels, and they will sit the laptops out on the hillside with the panels, and they'll charge them up for a while, and they take them back to the school and use them. But it's kind of a neat place. Now, when you go to a place like this, um, you don't stay in a fancy hotel, but the people will welcome you, and they will have some kind of guest house that you stay in. Uh, if you go to Haiti, you might not be in a guest house. You might be sleeping on the floor of the school. But they will have some place where you can stay, and your accommodations can range from a guest house to sleeping on the floor of the school. But it's you know what you want to know before you go, so you know what to take with you. But it's not anything flush, you're not going to be at the Hilton or anything like that. But Lesotho has a lot of things going there, and they have a group that goes down about twice a year. So if you're interested in going to Lesotho, um, you know, all these things are on your own dime, but it's a well worth, you know, going, and while you're there, you can take time out and go on a safari in South Africa and all that kind of stuff. So, and then write it off on your taxes because it was a volunteer thing. Malaysia, there's this guy, um, is it, it's either, I keep pointing at that instead of that. T.J. Kang, or no, T.K. Kang, or K.T. Kang. Anyway, the gentleman down on the left has been going down there for quite a while, uh, actually since 2009, setting up their internet in their system there at that school in Malaysia. And this school, um, he's in Hong Kong. And he's doing a really fabulous job down there, and they are one of the places that can use some volunteers. And what you want to do is get a hold of KT, DK. Uh, I was getting his name switched around, but anyway, he will help you with it. Nepal, uh, Nepal has wonderful stuff. They have things that they collected from a lot of places. They have their own stuff that they developed that's educational software. Plus they have educational software they got from the British Council of Education, or some British group. And they put this all together for the, what they call the Open Learning Exchange Nepal, OLE Nepal. And lots of good stuff that they have for the kids there. And they do take volunteers, and there have been a lot of people that have gone down and helped out there. Okay, and I think that's the last one before we talk about software. It is. This one doesn't have anything to do with OPC, except that when the guy first got the idea and started working with it, he was interested in putting it on the XOs, but he um, hasn't done that. He's doing it on other things. He's looking for people to help him develop software that can be used in things like rural clinics, for health education that doctors can use, nurses can use, patients can use. He has a whole bunch of different projects people can get involved with. And some of the things that he wants to do, um, he tells you the different, some of the languages that he wants you to have, but he's also interested in getting some of these things so they'll run on less expensive hardware like the Raspberry Pi and Arduinos and stuff like that. So he's trying to get it so he can get the cost down because this is to go out into India where 
places where people don't have a lot of money for big fancy computers like your doctor will have it. You go to the visit the doctor. So he's looking for volunteers, and there I will have when I put it up on the uh, internet. It'll have a live link, so you can use that link to go to it. Now, of course, the XSCE school server, that's another thing, that's kind of an offshoot from OLPC Foundation, but it's separate from the original school server. It's one that they've been developing, they're trying to get it so it's going to be really, really good. And they need people to work on that. Uh, Tim Moody is the person in charge of that. He has a whole document that he sent me of all the stuff that volunteers would want to know. Much, much too much to just talk about tonight. Oh, I'm sure going to be done in a hurry. <laughs> but I will put that document up, a link to the document. I'll stick it in um, Dropbox or something. Put a link up there so if you're interested in working on that, then you can go and take a look and see what Tim Moody wants. Now, with this one, this is where we get some of these sprints and hackathons and stuff like that. Um, Braddock went to one in Toronto, and they stayed at Adam Holt's parents' house, and I, I assume that was kind of nice. It's a farm. A farm, yeah, okay. And sometimes they do it in Boston. They'll do them in all kinds of places. So you get yourself there, and pretty much you don't have to pay anything once you're there, right? It's kind of whatever. But they're glad to have you, and you do whatever they want you to do and help out with building their software for the XSCP. Yeah, that stands for like XO, then the XS was the X, XO server, CE stands for Community Edition. Okay, now, <laughs> after this, you're not going to listen to anything else. How could you not want $100,000. <laughs> this is a contest, nothing to do with OLPC, except it, the whole idea is it's open source, it's education, and it's also getting things localized. So what they want to do is have software that a teacher will be, able, or anyone, it doesn't have to be a teacher, it could be a parent, it could be a volunteer somewhere, but anyone who isn't computer savvy computer literate but not savvy, can sit down and put in a story. It could be a children's story that they've gotten from somewhere else. It could be a story they've written. But they can put it in in the language of the kids. So it has to be easy to use and you can put it into the language and then the kids can use it and they've got it in their schools. So the idea of the contest is that you have until <coughs> July 18th to come up with a project. And after July 18th, they will evaluate the projects that have been turned in. And it can be more than one person working on it, so you can have a team working on it. And the three top teams, it's an international contest, so it's the whole world. The three top teams will each get $12,000 for the team. Oh, that's kind of nice. Then they'll go to a review board, or the review board, when they judge them, will say, okay, we really like your idea, it's one of the best ones we've got, but these are some things that you ought to do to make it better. So they send it back to you and you have a certain amount of time to make it better, give it back to them, and they send it out and they pilot it in some schools to find out how it works. So it means that people are going to be putting it into languages that use characters that are not our English alphabet. They're going to be putting it into these characters and Chinese and everything you can imagine because it, they want to make it localized so that we have to localize these children's stories. So they try them out in the schools and they're evaluated and when, after the evaluations are done in the schools, they will rate these three and the top one of the three gets $100,000 per team. So it's worth trying. You've got anybody that wants to do something, uh, I don't know, <laughs> if I could program a little better, I would try it myself. Okay, now, this one. This is a little project of Lionel Lasky. Uh, let's see, nobody here in San Francisco, did you? Except me. Okay, 
up in San Francisco, Lionel last we came over from Paris and did his little talk about um, his project with getting sugar to run on anything. It's web-based. And he doesn't have too many things on there yet, but he's working on it constantly. I mean, every time I go and look at it, he's got something else new on there, or one of the ones that he's already got works better. But he's working on these things, and he could use help. And this is kind of my favorite project. This is something because I've always felt that, you know, not every kid can give an XO because they're just too hard to come by. But every kid can get an old smartphone or can get a computer that can attach to the internet, can get some kind of device. All they have to do is be able to go to the internet and they can access this. Uh, if you just Google sugar, sugarizer.org or just sugarizer, it'll take you right to the site. Now everybody looks out their phone and tries it, right? I thought you might, but <laughs> do, try it if you like. Um, some of the things work really good and some don't, but they want to get as many sugar activities on there as possible. Now, at this point in time, they don't have a way to store them together in what they call the journal. How many of you are familiar with sugar and know how it works? Proud of it? <laughs> Maybe three of it. Okay. That's why we're listening. Okay. There's a thing called a journal, and it automatically saves everything the kid does, whether he wants to save it or not. This doesn't do that yet. Um, I kind of think what's going to have to happen if it were me that were designing the thing, I say, okay, we got your little app that you put in your device that's going to do the journal, and everything else is web based. So you do your little thing on the web, and it's into your device, whatever you're using it on, and there will be your uh, stuff stored. It will be an automatic storage. But so far, I don't think they've gone into that. But they're working on that, and uh, there's some things you can do. You can make a whole new sugar activity. You can take a sugar activity that already exists and adapt it for the internet. Uh, and he's got really great documentation. I can look at it and it's something even I could do. You know, and if that's the same quite a bit. I mean, I stopped programming with Pascal. Done a little bit of Python, you know, in the class I took I had to do it. But I'm sort of in the dark ages. But even I could do what he's got in there. So it's something that isn't really that difficult and it's something where there's a real need. And this would help to get sugar out all over the world. Now, any questions up so far? You came to find out things. Have you found out anything you need so far? Question? A, a naive question. But why is the XO desirable as opposed to an inexpensive Android tablet kind of thing? Have you seen one? Oh, Have no, you no, touched I've never seen one personally. Mm. Oh, but this one, unfortunately, I, this is one I lent out. And this one doesn't work unless you have it plugged in, unfortunately. But um, one thing that's good about them is they're extremely sturdy. Okay? Very, very sturdy. I could drop it, but I'm not going to. Uh, I mean, I've seen Nicholas Negrapati throw one, throw one across the floor, and it came through fine. But you get inside here, and you see you have a keyboard. Now, the new ones. The, the XO4 has a touch screen. This one is not a touch screen. This is an old XO1. Um, but the new ones, for this part, they have kind of a, a piece of plastic that goes over the membrane so that all that sticks up is the key part because kids were picking off the keys. One person sent theirs back in after the G1, G1, and said, my parent chewed the keys off. So, you know, it's just a, a rubber membrane, and so they're, they're kind of And it's also water resistant too. Well. It's, well, that's the whole idea. The thing, you know, a kid can drop this in a mud puddle, but it's all closed up like this. You see the ears, they're antennas. The ears cover all the ports. So the only thing that's left is there is the power port, and that, it's sealed too. There's just this little pole that sticks out that hooks into the plug that you put in. So it can be dropped in what 
things. I know people, oh, I dropped my XO in a puddle, what shall I do? Just recently somebody did that. And I said, well, just try it out and see what happens. And it was fine. Uh, so it has all of those features. Plus, you say, well, okay, why is it better than a tablet? Well, oops, put those down first. Essentially, it's also a tablet. You know, you can, you can just watch something streaming on it or something, but you can't type into it or touch it. That's true. That's true. But, I, you know, I've never tried it. Hmm. I wonder if you could use a wireless. Well, there are buttons, so you can advance pages in a book. But yeah, that's true. Different. You can and you can rotate it. So you have your, your image normally would be this way. You want to read it this way. So you, it's mainly to have it as a book reader. Now, you take it outdoors, and it's like um, the old Kindle paper white. You can read this in bright sunlight. You just turn it down so it's in the uh, grayscale mode instead of color mode. It's very, very easy to see them. Uh, let me see, what else is there Does about it? Does it use the e-ink technology for the display the way the original Kindle did? Or is it uh, just an LCD? It's an LCD. Yeah. Okay, with an extra bright uh, backlight so it can stand I think it's reflective. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. It's supposed to be that the kid could use it anywhere. Under, they yeah. talk about the class under a tree. You know, so the kids can okay. be out under a tree and take some pictures of it like that. Um, it's too bad it isn't charged up, but it can't be charged up. It's too bad I didn't bring you one to see. I just kind of assumed you would all. But <laughs> Fortunately, John had this checked out, and he brought it back tonight, so we do have it at least in So I'll send it around, and then you can take a look at it. Could you maybe um, talk a little bit about, these devices are running basically a version of Fedora, which runs yes. Sugar on top of them, which is a GTK-based uh, windowing system. Um, but the new tablets that are coming out actually run Android, and Sugarizer runs on HTML5. So you might want to just explain the difference and how things are sort of transitioning right now to Android, or if they are, I don't even know if Well, they are. Um, I'm going to mention something about that in a few minutes, but uh, there are some of us, myself included, who would like to see a transition to Android. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen, because it needs people like you guys to help make it happen. And because it's not going to happen from somebody spending a lot of money to do it, unless you win the hundred thousand dollars, you might be able to go part way toward doing it. But uh, no, it's gonna it's gonna have to happen with volunteers deciding that this is something we want to do. Otherwise, the regular sugar is continuing to be upgraded and updated, and new new additions come out. We try to get one out about every quarter. But the most stable one they have is from um, actually a couple of years ago. The, the best version for right now is from a couple of years ago. And of course, we have these machines have a lot less power. They have a ARM processor, and the new machines have a Intel. It's the other way around. Oh. Uh, no, I don't think so. Intel was a naughty word for a while there. So <laughs> I think maybe the other ones have the arm. Yeah, I don't know what this one has then, but the, the new ones have the arm. It uses less energy, but they're faster. But this one's pretty slow. And uh, so some of the things that the new X04 does well, this one, it's just too much for it. It doesn't have as much power and it has trouble doing it. But there are plenty of good activities, we call them. An activity is a little program for kids to use to learn things. There are plenty of good activities available in Sugar that will run on the XL1 and the XL15, which has twice the memory of, as this and a little more speed. Then there's the 175, uh, which essentially is the same as the XL4, except it doesn't have the touch screen. The XO4 has a touch screen. You can also get them with a click clack keyboard, which is you know like your standard keyboard instead of, but it's not waterproof obviously. So if you're getting it for little kids, you want to get the membrane keyboard. But if you're using them with uh, adults or teenagers, they would like the click clack better. In fact, in Uruguay, 
when they ordered machines for the secondary schools, they ordered them with the click clack keyboard, and they actually got them in a different color. They're blue because the bigger kids say, well, we don't want those green ones. That's what all the little kids have. Well, give us something else. So they had it made in blue for them. So there is a blue version out there, and I do have one of those at home. Uh, but most of them are the green with the different, all the different colors. There's a lot of different combinations you can get for the EXO design on it and everything. Other questions? So uh, some of the content was developed in Nepal, um, you know, in the language. Nepal. Right. Yes. Yeah, in the language. And then there's like uh, maybe, after, you know, other, Pakistan has some educational content, India does. Uh, what other countries have open source where education, where you're not trying to force English on? Oh, it's really difficult, but a lot of these different activities that they have on Sugar, they have quite a project going with localization. Yeah. And they have a little tool they call Poodle, which is the thing that allows you to go in, and if you know another language, you can pick something and do some translating on it. So they do have ways you can do it. No, that's done. That is done. At at the individual machine, or is that done in no, mass? No, that's or is it updated periodically. That's in the software. There's a lot of Spanish language stuff out there. Uh, Paraguay has some really great stuff, and of course Uruguay. Uruguay is you know where every single kid in the elementary school has an XO, and the secondary schools are getting them as well. So in Uruguay, there just there's a wealth of things. You can get so many things in Spanish. And they have uh, groups that do this for fun. You know, it's just, um, it's a hobby. And they come up with all kinds of really great activities that are designed in Spanish for the Spanish-speaking kids down there. And uh, they So is there a cross-pollinization between the different countries in Spanish? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, very much so. In fact, when I was talking about places to volunteer, I mentioned that mostly South American uh, people do the volunteer work in South America. And that's especially true in Paraguay. In Paraguay, they when they started deploying EXOs in Paraguay, they had a whole lot of uh, people from Argentina. A whole team went down to help them get started. And they didn't have the EXOs yet, so they had to have some way to teach the teachers how to use sugar. So they used the sugar on a stick version, but they had a Spanish version. And they went down and trained the teachers. So when the machines came, the teachers knew what to do with them. And that's one of the big problems. A lot of these places, you know, this, the teachers don't want to do it. And you know, they're afraid of computers. They don't want to be replaced by a computer. Uh, sometimes it's the principal that gets in the way. Um, Tony Anderson does a lot of work in Rwanda, and he has his version is like internet in a box, but it's other stuff. And he comes with Bernie, basic educational resources for yeah, education. Yeah, I would like to talk to Yeah, right. It's a nice set of software. It's really good. But he goes down there, and the, the government says, the children shall do computers one hour a week. <laughs> the rest of the time, they're doing all this other stuff. It never occurs to them that they could do reading and math and science on the computer. You know, that's a little hurdle that we've got to get people over. And it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. Especially since the teachers are swamped with so many other things. And they don't want to spend extra time to learn how to do these things because they're busy grading papers and worrying about their job next year and taking care of their own families and just so many things involved in their, in their lives that they don't want to have this other thing piled on top of them. Do they look at it as a luxury? Uh, no, they want their kids to be computer literate. They feel that this is really important. But it's only worth an hour or 45 minutes, maybe a week, to do it. So it's really hard. Uh, very often they go to after school clubs, some of these projects. So the kids do it after school. So it's not happening in the classroom, which is too bad. I can tell you a really sad story about my own experience with a uh, deployment that I did in Montana. I had this small rural school, actually it wasn't that small, they had about 100 kids, 
And I said, you know, I've got some XOs that have been used at Montana State University and they weren't going to use them. So I asked the principal if she'd like to have them in her school and do some. Oh, yes. She says, I have just the person. Why don't you talk to our second grade teacher and our science teacher? And I did. And they said, um, okay, sure. What can we do with them? Well, I taught the second grade teacher how to use Tam Tam. Now, Tam Tam is a really wonderful music program that's on the EXO. Did you try that at all, John? So you didn't look at Tam Tam? You like music, you will love Tam Tam. Tam Tam is so good. Uh, there's actually four levels of Tam Tam, and it goes all the way up to what's really like a professional synthesizer. You can just get all kinds of sounds and loops and all kinds of good stuff going. So I showed her how to use the very simplest Tam Tam thing to teach the kids the basic fundamentals of music, which second graders could do, and it was in the curriculum. Okay, so she was going to do that, but she went out on the turn to the so she didn't finish. So at the same time, I talked to the science teacher and his wife, and uh, no, that was the next year. But anyway, she didn't get a chance to do it. The science teacher didn't do anything with it. So next year, I said, okay, what are we going to do with the machines? The principal said, well, I have just the thing. We have a new music teacher and a new science math teacher. Why don't you put them with them? Okay. So I had them both over to our log cabin on the Yellowstone River for dinner. And we spent a couple of hours introducing them to sugar and how they could use it in the science classroom, doing all kinds of experiments and things because it's got a, a oscilloscope on it. It's got places where you plug in sensors. And you know, it's a wonderful, gee, if I were back in the classroom teaching science, I would love to have it. And of course, the music teacher, I showed her what they could do. Went away, they were happy as a plan. They had their dozen machines to use with their classes, small classes, because it's this rural school. Come back in the fall, or the spring, next year, it was actually last summer, and I asked the principal, how are things going with the XOs? Oh, well, they're in my office. Why don't you come pick them up? <laughs> okay, what's going on? So I went in, and she says, well, and she says, the kids have to take the Common Core exams on a desktop machine. We don't want them to get confused by using other things that they might get confused and they won't do well on their tests they have to take. Oh, okay, well, fine. So I walk in the room, she said, they're in my office, you can pick them up. So I go in and there they are, a dozen XOs, and there's all these other computers. And I said, what are these? Oh, we didn't want them to use those either. And they had probably 100 kids in the school, had about 100, because some rich person had donated them, about 100 nice little small laptops with backpacks that somebody had donated to the school for them to use. But the principal wouldn't let them use those either, because they wanted them to use only a half a dozen desktops that they had that they could go in and use once a week so they could learn to take the common class. Okay. Where did you see this one? This is in Montana. Montana. Okay? Sounds too much like California. Well, yeah, it might, although, you know, don't say bad things about Common Core because I'm convinced it's good. If you like open source, if you like the kids to do cooperative learning, if you like project-based learning, you'll like Common Core because that's what it's all about. Teaching the kids to think, to work with one another, uh, to be creative, and that's what I still don't know how they're going to test for that. I have Apple. to, huh? Apple platform. Apple. <laughs> I, have to, I have to see what the tests look like, but I know that the basic curriculum for it sounds like a dream. If you're, you know, I was a teacher who tried to do those things back in the old days when nobody did them. But um, to be able to do that is what you're supposed to do. It's going to take a couple years, too. You, know, it's, uh, it's, you are just had a huge drop in the test grades as a result. Oh, of it's going to take a while. So, yeah. yeah, these kids actually thought that they were pretty smart until they actually got, <laughs> you know, and especially in certain other states. The tests? Yeah, I've actually looked at some of the, you know, some of the curriculum and stuff. Yeah, I'd like to see what the questions are like because, you know, how are you going to, if the kid's working on project based learning and working on cooperative learning and all that, now he sits down alone at a computer terminal. How are you going to test for that? You know, there's no connection as far as I can see. 
So, any more questions? So I got just a little bit left. Okay, let's go. We've got all these other things. Uh, we did that. We're going the wrong way. We don't want to forget that software competition. Okay, the most fun thing, international meetups. You get involved with this and you meet people online all over the world, literally all over the world. And you say, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could get together sometime? Well, they do. And here's some examples of some of the recent ones. Now, I went to EduJam, um, when did we go? About three years ago, I guess, when it was in Montevideo. Now, C.A. Ball, who puts on EduJam, is um, the name for OLEC in Uruguay. So they've gone, and this past year, because it's usually in the fall, they had it in uh, Ascension, Paraguay. So they have, everybody comes there, and we went down when we did it in Montevideo, we went down on frequent flyer tickets, we flew to Argentina, we had a great time, we danced the tango in Argentina, and then we went over to Montevideo, we went to the conference, my computer died on the ferry, coming back, hard drive was some curtains. But anyway, it was a great trip. Now as I look at that picture there, I don't know everybody in that picture, but I know quite a few of them. And I've, some I've met online, and some I've met in person, back in Montevideo. So, really uh, San Francisco, that's something any of you can afford to go to. You know, you can even drive there. And they've been doing that every year in October. Uh, that just happened to be the first picture I came to uh, that they had one last year, and they had one. Uh, when was the community summit? That was in October, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in October. So we went up there, we flew up, and uh, you go to that, and we stayed at a hotel that was near the, it's at San Francisco State University business campus which is down uh, downtown San Francisco, right on Market Street. And so we see it at a hotel that was nearby, but a lot of the people that go to these will stay at homes of the people, and we did that one year, at homes of people that are members of the San Francisco OVC group. That is a really, it's a strong group. There's a professor at, um, San Francisco State <coughs> Business Campus, who is very active with it, and he's the one that makes sure this all happens. He and there's a young guy that helps put it on too. But they do all kinds of talks and things. Then the one in the lower left was in um, Malaysia. So they just recently had one in Malaysia. So they're having them all over the world. So if you like to travel and you've gotten involved and if you met these people and you want to know more about it, you want to meet them face to face, you got a chance to do it. And uh, usually when you get there, you'll find that it's fairly inexpensive and they know the locals know all the good places to go to eat that don't cost too much and things like that. Now, there actually is one going on this coming weekend. It's in Paris. If you happen to be going to Paris this weekend, there's something for you to go to. Uh, they're doing a lot of neat things. Um, Adam Holtz, who some of you have met, is going to be doing a talk there. Uh, Tony Anderson's doing a talk there. Christoph Durndorfer, who used to edit the OLPC News, he finally decided to throw in the towel. He was tired of doing that, but he did it for many, many years. Uh, he's going to be doing a talk down there. Lionel Lasky, who is the one that's doing the sugarizer, is going to be doing a talk. There. All kinds of things going on for two days. And unlike some of the really big conferences, you don't have conflicts in this one. You know, there's just one thing at a time on Saturday, and then one thing at a time on Sunday. So you just can go all day. Is that French and English? Interestingly enough, almost every session is in English. Because you've got people coming who speak French and German and Spanish, and who knows what all else, and they do it all in English. So you don't have any trouble understanding it. Now, this they're going to record it, and it's going to be available online. So if you want to know more about Sugarizer, for example, there will be a talk about Sugarizer on, let's see, Sunday, I think it's in the afternoon, by Lionel Lasky, the guy that's the developer of it, and he's working on it right now. I know if you went into that site right now, you would see that 
he's doing, he is, uh, he just edited this three hours ago, so you know he's getting it ready for Sunday. But um, he's going to do a talk about it and, you know, tell all kinds of good stuff about how it's working. So that will be recorded. Now, it will probably be live streamed. The only trouble is, there's a nine hour time difference between here and Paris. So if you want to watch the live stream, it means that for the keynote on Saturday morning and Sunday morning, you've got to get up at 1.30 a.m. So you No, 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 I mean, you got to go to bed at 3 or 4 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you just stay up a little later. Yeah, it's like one of my friends whom I haven't met yet is in Australia. He lives in the outback, and he actually uh, is a developer for the OLPC, uh, for the software. And whenever I get stuck, I go on IRC. How many of you know what IRC is? You never go there. Yeah, okay. Well, we've got IRC for <laughs> OLPC. So we go on IRC, and I'll put out a little message that says, help, I don't know how to do this. It's not working right. And James Cameron down there in whatever town he's in in Australia. Now I'm doing this, it's maybe 10 o'clock at night, I've been working on this project, and I'm sitting in my cabin in Montana, and he's sitting in the Australian outback, and I say, help, I need to do some help with this. And so James will give me some information. Said, okay, uh, I'll try it in the morning. I'll be back in the morning and let you know how it works. So next morning, I try it. it works or not, so I go back on, and James is there, okay, James is ready to go to bed, I just got up, so I'll say, hey James, this is what happened, but it's still not working quite right, so we just go on, you know, meeting online in strange places and times like that, but it's really very helpful. So anyway, there is a schedule for Sugar Camp up there, and I can put all these things on. Now, I have a handout for you. And I have a theory about handouts. If you do a handout on a piece of paper, chances are it's going to get lost. So I do my handouts on cards. Because you can just stick this in your wallet. And you can get it out of your wallet. So just, uh, we'll start on both sides. Take one and pass it on and then it's Oh, but maybe not. I know it did. You'll notice they're recycled. Take one and send them down. So on the back of this are, oh, on the front first. Uh -huh. On the front, um, we're calling this OPC 2.0. That is a term that was coined by uh, K.T. Kang or K.J. Kang, whatever. Anyway. That new guy that's working down in Malaysia. And he coined that term, OPC 2.0. And so that's why we have this card. My email is down here in the lower left corner. And if there's anything you want to know about volunteering, and uh, just send me a question. And that's my email. It'll get to me. I have a whole bunch of different emails, but this one will get to my email box one way or another. And I have things forwarded. Did you get one? I have one. No, it's different. Oh. I put a few different things on the back. Now you organize it. And then on the right hand side is Adam Holt's email. Adam is in charge of volunteers. And uh, he sort of asked the people, asked me, but you can always ask Adam about volunteering in some places. Um, if it's going to be in Bolivia, Adam doesn't know what's going on in Bolivia. I do. So ask me for Bolivia. Okay, then on the back, we've got all kinds of cute little things. Um, we suggest you start with a map, and you go to the map, and it's going to uh, show you where projects are or have been all over the world. Some of those are still active, some are not. But they give you an idea of where things are. Then go to wiki.laptop.org this particular country you're interested in, go to the wiki, look it up, see what's going on. Now, you're going to find some pages that haven't been updated in a couple of years, some of them. Doesn't mean that the project isn't still going. They may have just been too busy to get to the wiki and update it. But it'll give you an idea what's there. Uh, Sugar Labs has their own wi a wiki and website, and they're the ones that do the software. 
Uh, Planet.laptop.org is a place where there's all kinds of news, not just about OPC and Sugar, but other open source as well. So you'll find good stuff there. The blog is what it says it is. And there's a lot of people that write things for that. Then Unleash Kids, this is the group that Adam has and that uh, Kurt is in, and they're doing the thing in Haiti. Uh, if you want to buy an X04, he's got a package deal for you where he throws in some extra goodies. And I don't know what his current price is on that, but he is doing it as a fundraiser for his Haiti project. So it's going to be more than the approximately 240 that the things cost. Uh, schoolserver.org is where you go to find out about working on the school server. We know about Internet in a Box. It's on there. Sugarizer, I told you about that one today. And then the bottom one, that is a web page I set up way back in January when we were doing scale. And I haven't been back to do anything. I'm going to this weekend go in and put up all these links. So if you want to find a link, you can go to one of these links. They'll all be there. They'll all be live. And the document that we've got from Tim Moody, I'm working on the um, XSCE, will be there. Uh, all kinds of good stuff. If you want to explore more, you'll be able to go there and find out. Okay? Any questions?